Right, well, this evening we're uh, just going to look at a few verses in uh, Luke's gospel. We have been taking larger uh, chunks, but um, this one really, um, uh, the subject matter uh, is, is actually pretty extensive in these, uh, in these few verses. And as we look at uh, the, uh, again, the doctrine of, of God's choosing us, the, of, of what we call election, we're only going to be able to touch on it because we want to deal with Jesus' choice of Judas to, um, to be the one who would uh, betray him, which is essentially what Luke is telling us in his last statement here. So let's begin by reading the text in Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 16. It was at this time that he went off to the mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot who became a traitor. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our uh, understanding and our edification this evening. Now, remember this morning, uh, we saw some very important things. We saw Jesus declaring himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. And that reminded us, first of all, that Jesus is God because only God has authority over something that God has established. I mean, just imagine somebody saying, I am the Lord of the Sixth Commandment or I am the Lord of the Fifth Commandment. He declares himself to be the Lord of the Fourth Commandment and really there's only one Lord over the law and that is God. When Moses, who was the first lawgiver, spoke, he would say, thus says the Lord, because he was a servant of the Lord. He was a servant in the house, as the author to the Hebrews reminds us. But Jesus is a son over the house, which is the house of God. He is the Lord. When Jesus, the second Moses, the second lawgiver speaks, he says, you have heard it said, but I say to you, which is quite a bit different, as you can see, the character of what he says than uh, what the servants of the Lord say. We saw that as the Lord of the Sabbath, that Jesus wasn't taking the Sabbath away. Um, we still need to rest from our work. We still need this day off. Nor was he changing how we would observe the Sabbath. We still need to meet together for that spiritual refreshment that worship and fellowship gives to us. But rather, as again, the Lord of the Sabbath and the Lord of the law as the Lord, he was uh, correcting the misinterpretation of the scribes and Pharisees. Um, God gave us this day to be a blessing to us. Uh, and apparently the scribes and Pharisees didn't agree. They thought that the day was made to be a hardship to us. It was given to us maybe to, to prove our love for the Lord, that we might keep this day. But the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And so Jesus says, no, this is not a day in which we need to go hungry when they accuse the disciples of doing work on the Sabbath by picking the heads of grain and eating them. And it also is not a day to make people suffer. The man with the withered hand was healed by Jesus, even though they accused him for that as well. The Lord wants us to show mercy to ourselves, and he wants us to show mercy to others. So rest and showing mercy are a part of this day. This evening, Jesus turns his attention to calling together his inner circle, uh, the 12 apostles, the men he would train to carry on his work when his time in this world had come to its end, when his work was completed. Now, in this passage, as I've already mentioned, we do see three things. First of all, Jesus giving himself uh, to prayer before calling the 12. Secondly, uh, who these men were that, that he called. And then thirdly, that his call to each of these men was not exactly the same. Uh, Judas is obviously singled out as being called to something uh, different. Now, first of all, Jesus gave himself to prayer before calling the 12. Uh, obviously, this is a very important decision. Um, there were many people who were following Jesus. There were many disciples, and sometimes we confuse those two terms, disciples and apostles, but they are two different things. 
uh, Jesus now chooses 12, only 12 of them, to become his apostles. Now, apostle means messenger, means one who was sent. And in the scriptures, we do run into a, just really two different types of apostles. Sometimes uh, individuals might be called apostles who were sent by a church. And so they are apostles of this particular church or that particular church. But we also see that there are only 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. We see that when Peter identifies himself to his readers in his letters, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And Paul essentially says the same thing. Now, these were, again, particular men called apart to be the apostles of Christ, those Jesus chose to be with him, those he would invest himself in, those who would be the eyewitnesses of his miracles, and those who would hear his teaching, who would be with him from the very beginning to the very end, those whom he would send out to preach in his name, that he would send out to do miracles and raise the dead and cast out demons, those who would represent him, some of whom would be instrumental in writing portions of Scripture, uh, most of whom would carry on his work after him, uh, whom he would send out into the world uh, to preach the gospel, to make disciples of, of all the nations. Now, before he calls them, he went off to this mountain in order to seek his father, uh, to pray for wisdom. And Luke tells us that he spent the whole night in prayer. And this reminds us, again, that Jesus is, is fully man as well as fully God. And as a man, he had our limitations, and he needed wisdom. And when he needed wisdom, he sought his father for this wisdom. If we conceive of, of the man Christ Jesus as having full access to infinite knowledge and infinite power and infinite wisdom, I think we, we miss the point. Luke has already told us he had to grow up, that he had to learn wisdom, uh, and he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with man. Jesus is fully man. But here, Jesus is giving us again an example of how we ought to live and what we need to do when we need wisdom. I mean, where do we go? when we need wisdom, especially for important decisions? Well, we need to go to God. We need to seek for His wisdom. We need to go, I think, first to His Word, which is where He reveals to us uh, the will of God for our salvation. Uh, we have everything we need pertaining to life and godliness, Paul tells us, in the Scriptures. But we also need to ask the Lord for wisdom, even as Jesus did. And we need to believe that he will give us the wisdom that we're seeking. James tells us in James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Now, this is essentially a command to us. If we need wisdom, we need to ask God for it. But then he goes on to tell us how we need to ask. But he must ask in faith without any doubting, for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. We need to pray, but we need to pray believing that God is going to be faithful to his promise to give us the wisdom that we're seeking him for. So we need to pray for this wisdom, and we need to remember that this wisdom we're praying for, if we put the kingdom of heaven first, as Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, the wisdom that we should be seeking is the wisdom we need to glorify God in the different decisions that we're going to make. We need to seek the Lord in a way that shows that we really desire uh, an answer to this prayer, that we really want this wisdom so that we can glorify Him. We need to pray in the name of Jesus because... We can't approach God on our own. We need to come through the mediator. And, of course, we need to continue to pray in faith until he answers that prayer. I mean, think about this. Jesus was praying for wisdom to make this decision that he needed to make among all his disciples. And he spent the whole night in prayer. And if Jesus needed to pray the whole night, how much more do we need to pray for the wisdom that we need? Now, secondly, we see that when morning came, having received the Father's answer to his prayer, 
Jesus chooses then the 12. Now Luke lists them in six groups of two. He pairs them off. And it's likely because Jesus would often send them out in, in pairs. And perhaps this reflects the pairs or the pairing which he, he used. Uh, Solomon reminds us in Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 through 10, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. So Jesus, when he would send his disciples out to preach and teach in the villages and to represent him, he would send them out in, in pairs so that they would have this mutual support. And I think that's a model, obviously, we ought to continue to follow uh, today. Now, the first two are Simon and Andrew. Uh, Jesus, as we know, gives Simon the name Peter. The name Peter means rock or stone. Peter is also called Cephas in Scripture, which is basically the Aramaic word uh, for the same thing, rock or stone. Uh, and Peter is the, the Greek form of the word. And the reason why he gives him this name is because for the most part, this describes the character of Peter, although, as we know, not all the time, um, because we'll, we know from, as we're going to see ahead in the Gospels, uh, Peter would eventually run away with the rest of the apostles and run away from Jesus when he's arrested. The shepherd is, is struck and the sheep scatter. Uh, when Jesus was... Uh, Arrested, he would deny him, of course, three times at his trial, and then he would hide after his crucifixion. Wouldn't necessarily call him at that point a stalwart, but Cephas or Peter refers to what it is he would become by God's grace, because after the coming of the Holy Spirit, Peter is the one who preached to that huge crowd of Jews, and 3,000 were converted on that particular day on Pentecost. He would be the first to bridge the first gap, we might say, between uh, cultures um, as it goes from the Jews to what we call the God-fearers as he preaches to Cornelius and his household, uh, again, as the Lord uh, calls him to do. He would be one who would write two books of the New Testament, and if we're not already aware of it, uh, he is believed to be the source of Mark's gospel. Mark was not an apostle. He was a close associate of an apostle, and that apostle was Peter. Andrew, we know, was Peter's brother. And the only thing we really know about Andrew, apart from what the disciples were all doing with Jesus throughout his ministry, was that he was one of the first two to follow Jesus after John the Baptist pointed him out, remember? And he is the one who first went and found his brother Peter and introduced Peter to Jesus. So perhaps uh, his greatest contribution may be the fact that he brought Peter uh, to Jesus. Now the second pair is James and John. Remember James and John are also brothers. They are the sons of Zebedee. Uh, they're also called the sons of thunder in scripture uh, because of their character. They happen to be two rather fiery individuals. Uh, they are the ones who uh, on one occasion asked Jesus after this village of Samaritans rejected him, Jesus, do you want us to call fire down out of heaven to consume this village because they rejected you? And of course, Jesus turns to them and says, you don't know what you're talking about. I didn't come out here to destroy people. I came out here to save them. So again, just the, the zeal that these two brothers had. Now, this is the James that would later be killed by Herod. Uh, and when Herod sees that that pleases the people, he would arrest Peter. Uh, that had, takes place in Acts chapter 12. And John, of course, is the disciple that Jesus loved, the one who reclined uh, on Jesus at the Last Supper, the one who wrote the Gospel of John, the one who wrote the three letters bearing the same name, and the one who wrote that very difficult book uh, called the Book of Revelation that we are currently reading and are reading the Bible together that we're going to discuss uh, shortly. The third pair is Philip and Bartholomew. Philip is the one that uh, Jesus will later turn to after, um, you know, he's preaching to these 5,000 people and it gets late and he says, yeah, Jesus, let's, let's send them away so they can, you know, they can go get food. And Jesus turns to Philip and he says, where can we get food to feed all these people? And Philip's like, oh, I don't know. Lord, uh, you know. 
He's the one that the Greeks will come to and later and say, uh, we want to see Jesus. And he's also the one who's later in the upper room going to ask Jesus to show them the Father. And Jesus is going to say to him, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, Philip is also the one who, after Jesus calls him to follow him, goes out and finds Nathanael. Remember Nathanael? And he brings him to Jesus. Now, again, Nathanael seems to be somebody who just disappears after that, but Nathanael is actually believed that Bartholomew, the second one who is mentioned in this pair, is actually Nathanael. Bartholomew is not, is not really a proper name. Bartholomew is, is more like a last name. It essentially means the son of, of Talmai. Uh, it's essentially the same thing as, as Simon Bar-Jonah. Remember Simon, the son of Jonah? This is Bartholomew. Okay, so this would be more of his last name. Nathaniel would be his given name or his first name, the one of whom Jesus said when he saw him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Remember, Nathaniel then says, how do you know me? And he says, before, uh, you know, when I, when, before we came here, I saw you under the fig tree. And he says, you are the Messiah. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus says, do you believe? Because I said, I saw you under the fig tree. You're going to see greater things than this. Nathaniel followed Jesus, and he was a part of this uh, inner circle. The fourth pair is Matthew and Thomas. Matthew, remember, we've already met. He's Levi, the tax collector. He's the one who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Thomas is the one who later will earn the name, uh, Doubting Thomas. Uh, he's the one who didn't believe when the disciples saw Jesus after the resurrection because he was the only one who wasn't there when it took place. Thomas is also called Didymus, which in Aramaic is, is essentially means the same thing as the name Thomas does, both of which mean twin likely because Thomas was a twin, although I don't know that we meet the other, the other uh, half of this pair. Now, the fifth pair is James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot. Uh, James was, interestingly, uh, likely the brother of Levi. This is something that um, I hadn't noticed before, but we read in Mark 2.14, Jesus, well, this is what Mark records, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he got up and followed him. Uh, James is the son of Alphaeus, Levi is the son of Alphaeus. We don't know if it's the same Alphaeus, but it's certainly possible that it was. Now, we don't know much more about this particular James, and if you actually get into the scriptures and you try to sort out who all these people are and how they relate to other James in scripture, it sometimes can be confusing. Some believe that he is the one that is the brother of our Lord, the one who um, you know, would be a half-brother because obviously Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, the one who was the leader of the council in Jerusalem, the one who wrote the letter of James that we just quoted from, but others believe that, that he isn't that particular James. But one thing we do know is from one historic record regarding him that this James was stoned by the Jews for preaching the gospel. He gave his life also as um, the other James, the, the son of Zebedee did. Simon is called a zealot either because he was very zealous for religion, he had a fiery kind of heart like the sons of thunder, or it could be that he was a member of the sect of Jews called the, the zealots before he was called by Jesus. And it's possible both of these things are true. The zealots were called zealots for a reason. It's because they were zealous for the traditions of Israel, particularly against the Romans. And then finally, there is Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot. The first Judas, this first Judas, I should say, is also called Thaddeus in Scripture. And we really don't know much more about him. Than, than that. Uh, the second is Judas Iscariot, and we know quite a bit about him, but we're going to um, look at him in, in just a moment. Now, again, these are the men that Jesus called from all his disciples to be his apostles, uh, whom he would use to lay the foundation of the New Testament church. So they're very important men, right? 
uh, God essentially, our Lord Jesus gave his word through them, uh, gave eyewitness testimonies of, of what he said, what he did, uh, wrote letters explaining. Uh, there's really a great treasure of, uh, that we have through their ministry, not, not the least of which is by establishing the church and by going out and evangelizing. That gospel eventually got to us. So they're very important. But another thing that I think we can take away from this is, is this, that um, these men were called from the disciples, right? The disciples were those who followed Jesus, those who, who gave up everything, those who took up their crosses, who were willing to lay down their lives. These men were set apart for a special purpose. Now, we're not apostles, but we are disciples, right? If, if we're following Jesus, if we're trusting Jesus, we're also called disciples which means that Jesus has also called us to the task of continuing the work that he began. All this work was not done just by the apostles. It was done by all the disciples, among whom the apostles, of course, were part of that group. Now, we have that call, but we're going to serve in a different capacity. Uh, wherever the Lord has called us to be salt and light, to be Christ to our neighbor, so we need to strive, as the, uh, the majority of the apostles did, to be faithful to that calling. Now, finally, um, the call to each of these men was not exactly the same. Now, it was in one sense because they were all called to be apostles. Do you know that Judas went out with the twelve, with his, his other half, you know, the, the pairs? He performed miracles. He preached the gospel. He raised the dead. He did miracles. You don't have to be saved to have those miraculous powers in those days when those powers were at work. But, of course, um, he was called to another purpose besides that. Now, in each of the lists of the apostles in the Gospels, Judas Iscariot is always the one who was listed last because he was the most dishonorable among the group. He was the one who would betray Jesus. Luke writes in verse 16, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now, the fact that he was chosen, you know, chosen by Jesus, chosen to be an apostle, shouldn't be confused um, with um, what it means to be chosen in another sense. I mean, the Word of God oftentimes uses the same word for, for differing purposes. Uh, there can be a choice to one thing and a choice to another thing. Now, Jesus chose Judas to be an apostle. Well, that doesn't mean that he was also chosen in the sense that Paul speaks of in numerous places in the New Testament and in one place in particular, Ephesians 1.4, chosen unto life. When he speaks uh, about the Ephesians uh, that were believing Christians, he says, just as he chose us in him, that is, in Christ, that is the Father choosing us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that is before he had created in eternity, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Now, here's another interesting thing to notice. The Lord did not choose us because we were holy and blameless. We can't, you know, we're, we come into this world, as, as David says, uh, conceived and born in sin. Uh, we're the enemies of God as we come into the world. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who does good. Paul talks about the condition of man. Um, those who are in the flesh cannot please God and so forth. We don't come into the world this way. We can't make ourselves this way. He didn't choose us because we were holy and blameless. He didn't choose us also because we would choose Christ and become holy and blameless. But Paul says he chose us in him in eternity that we would be holy and and blameless before him by giving us the grace to trust in the Lord Jesus. Now, that is true of everyone who was chosen in Christ, but that's not the, the choice that is involved here. In the case of Judas, he was chosen for another reason. He was chosen that he might be the one to betray Jesus. Now, let me again read to you the meditation we read um, as we began the service. In John 6, verses 70 and 71, Jesus says, Did I myself not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? Now he meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, 
one of the twelve was going to betray him. Uh, Jesus chose Judas for this purpose. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means, among other things, that Judas was passed over in God's mercy. Judas was left in the same condition in which he came into the world. Uh, Jesus said, um, one of you is a devil. And essentially, that is the way we come into the world. We have the same heart, the same desires, essentially, as the devil. And the only reason why we're not any worse, or I should say it's bad, as the devil is because God is restraining the sin that's in our hearts. Judas had that heart, the heart of a devil. He had the same heart as the scribes and the Pharisees who hated Jesus. He had the same heart as everyone who is today unconverted. And that's the reason why when the devil came to him, he found in him the ally he needed to betray Jesus to the Jews. It says in Scripture in John 13, 2, that, uh, that Satan or the devil having put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him, Judas left in order to go do that. He had to be betrayed to the Jews, that the Jews might hand him over to the Romans, that he might be crucified. We're told in Acts chapter 4 that was part of God's plan, to hand Jesus over to be crucified by the hands of wicked men according to God's predetermined plan. Jesus had to die in order that he might pay for the sins of his people, that he might provide an atonement that would save us. Now, the Lord told us, uh, told his church essentially much earlier that his son's betrayal would be at the hands of a close associate. And we already read that in Psalm 41. That's the way that this had to take place. This is what God's plan was. Uh, Jesus tells us as much in the Upper Room Discourse in John 13, verses 18 through 19. He says, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the Scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. From now on, I am telling you before it comes to pass so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. So Jesus says, I know whom I've chosen, and this is the chosen in the sense of chosen to eternal life, but this one is not, okay? This is the one that is going to fulfill the Scripture. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. And again, remember that in the course of the, the meal, Jesus, uh, somebody asked him, one of his disciples, one of his apostles asked him, who's going to betray you, Jesus? And he says, the one that I dip, basically dip the bread in the bowl and I hand to, that's the one. The one, the one who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Now, think about this for a minute. Does that mean that Judas didn't have a choice? That Judas was forced to betray Jesus, that he did something against his will? No. Judas had a choice just like the rest of us. God never forced him to do anything against his will. Judas did this because this is what Judas wanted to do. He wanted to profit from this betrayal. He turned Jesus in for 30 pieces of silver and promised to hand him over to his enemies. Judas did that because that's what Judas wanted to do. We know that God's election, God's choice, does not override man's freedom to choose what he wants to choose. Okay, Man is free to choose what he wants, and I think you understand that what the, the, where the problem lies is in what he wants, you know, because we come into this world not wanting him, and so we choose against him. When God chooses to have mercy upon us, he changes our heart so that we do want him. The Father didn't force us to come to Jesus against our will through his choosing us. He simply opened our eyes to our need of a Savior, and he changed our hearts so that we might look at Jesus and see him to be that which is attractive, one who meets our needs, so that we would come to him freely. We were not forced to come to Jesus. We came to Jesus because that's what we wanted to do, because God had mercy upon us. Again, we need to come to grips with what the Bible says of our condition coming into the world and to realize that, um, well, as Jesus said on one occasion, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Um, 
that's actually what Paul says, I think, in Romans chapter 8. What is it that Jesus says precisely? Um, uh, the flesh profits nothing. Okay, as we come into the world, our flesh, which is all we have, is not going to help us at all when it comes to the things of the Lord. It doesn't profit us at all. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. We need the Spirit, and He gives us the Spirit to breathe life into us, to change our hearts so that we come willingly. Now, that is what Jesus did for the 11, but He did not do that for Judas. And God can do that. Paul tells us that God has sovereign right over the clay to make what He desires of each. Paul writes in Romans 9, verses 18 through 21, listen to what Paul says and what, what he, I mean, he means exactly what he says here. So then, he has mercy on whom he desires, and he hardens whom he desires. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? That is, why does he find fault with me? For who resists his will? Who can? On the contrary, who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? We see this, this clay, this lump of clay, as essentially being the human race, fallen and deserving of hell. But God can and has chosen some of this to make into vessels for honorable use. He did that in eternity, as we saw earlier in Ephesians 1, verse 4. He has chosen to do this through the work of His Son in order that He might use them, in order that He might use us to magnify His grace. The only reason why there are any who choose the Lord is because the Father has determined, the, the potter has determined to take some of this clay and to make vessels for honorable use. There are also those for common use. Those are those he passes over in his mercy. But he has chosen some for honorable use. And if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ tonight, the only reason why we are is because the Father has chosen to make us vessels for honorable use. And so let's remember, let's never forget, I should say, the pit from which he dug us. God didn't choose us because... We were more attractive than others because we were better than others, because we were more intelligent than others. The Bible doesn't actually say why he chooses one over another, except it's purely by his good pleasure. He chose to, dug us, to dig us out of that pit and to make us this type of vessel for his use. We owe our salvation entirely to him. And so we should let that motivate us to serve him because he has singled us out for this tremendous honor. As the disciples who were called apostles were singled out for this honor, they served him also with all their heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord give us the grace to do the same. Well, let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's um, pray that the Lord would help us to do this.